Welcome, welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted publicly. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn over the call to Crystal Jemerson. Crystal, it's yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Where Did My Family Live? Finding Your Family on a Census Enumerator Map. My name is Crystal Jemerson, and I'm a Data Dissemination Specialist here at the U.S. Census Bureau. I want to thank you for joining us today for the It's All in the Tools webinar series. This new series was created by the Census Academy team here at the Census Bureau. You can register for any of the workshop webinars by accessing census.gov. We will post the workshops monthly for early registration. Just visit census.gov forward slash academy. Please note seating is limited first come first serve basis. We think these hands-on exercise based workshops will be a valuable opportunity for you to learn from our experts about how to access the Census Bureau data tools and resources. <coughs> if you wish to follow along, take a moment now to open an additional browser to participate in the exercises. Before I introduce today's speaker, let's go over a few important housekeeping rules. As mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded. For your convenience, it will be uploaded to our Census Academy site with all supplemental materials relating to the webinar. In terms of how to ask questions during the webinar, you can submit your written questions using the Q&A panel, which is at the bottom center or the right side of your WebEx screen. Please take a moment to locate that now. Once you find the Q&A panel, Make sure you choose All Panelists. From the drop-down menu, this will ensure we see your question. Don't send your question to an individual panelist. Also, we ask that you do not include any personal or business identifiable information with your questions. Now definitely keep the chat panel open because this is where we will provide key links and other resources. Keep in mind you won't be able to respond to the chat Chat is just for us to send you links and other resources. In the chat box, we will be sharing throughout the webinar the link to our evaluation. We are very interested in hearing from you how we are doing. My, colleague, my colleagues Jamie Middlebrook and Jamie Dunn will be monitoring the Q&A panel. As time allows, we will answer your questions directly through the Q&A panel or we will share your question with the presenter to respond to throughout the workshop. If we don't get to all the questions with the response during the webinar, we will post the questions and responses with the webinar materials on the census.gov forward slash academy site within 30 business days. Again, as mentioned before, near the end of the webinar, we'll put into the chat a link to our evaluation so you can tell us how we did today. We hope you'll take the time to complete as we are always looking for ways to improve our training. As you know, we are in a virtual environment and sometimes technical difficulties might occur. If you are having issues, try a different browser such as Chrome or consider logging out and coming back into the session. If you are having audio issues, try selecting the computer audio or calling into the webinar via phone. Now I would like to introduce our speaker, Susie Prevett. Thanks again for being here today. Susie, you may begin. Thank you. So where did my family live? Using census enumeration maps. Searching for your family history is a bumpy road in many, many ways. You go through many resources, looking for past family members, uh, and sometimes it could be a rabbit hole. So, all the resources available, there's one you may not have considered, and that's using a census enumeration map. 
So this workshop today will cover searching enumerator maps to find some of your past families' home locations in past censuses. The Data Dissemination Training Branch offers our data users free training, presentations, and speakers for all topics Census Bureau related. We have short videos with how-to instructions on using our tools and databases. There are courses you can learn at your own pace and webinars recorded live, such as this one, that are cataloged for your viewing. So please don't hesitate to contact us. They are available to you at no cost from our website. Hello, my name is Susanna Guerra Privet. I'm a data dissemination specialist based in Texas. I'm born and raised in Texas, and I started a journey with genealogy like many of you may have um, where I decided I wanted to know more about my family. Uh, back in 2012, I was going through some documents of my mother's and I found these lists. She was a great list maker, but these lists had names. They were family names and I felt like I should know who these people are but yet I wasn't really familiar. And I couldn't ask her, there weren't any notations. And so that started my journey, uh, trying to find past family members on both my mother and my father's side of the passion. That's where my passion was born. And I feel very fortunate that I have a job that I really enjoy doing and I'm able to combine it today with a passion that I have for genealogy or family history research. So we're going to discuss today um, using stories, finding clues, uh, talking to your family um, for information, uh, using census records, uh, getting addresses for uh, families. Uh, using enumeration maps, and possibly using these maps as another layer to your family story, if you've not considered that before. So what do you know about your family? That's something that when you start doing genealogy, you come to this question. Maybe you talked with your family in the past. Maybe your grandparents told you stories about family members. Uh, or you just at a family gathering started asking questions. And that is a great place to start. If they have documents or pictures or just the stories that they're telling, uh, those are all great ways to start your research. And it's possible that a family member may have started a family tree, or maybe they've done some research. Uh, maybe it's on the other side of a family that you aren't going to do research for. If you've never created a family tree, there are some online programs uh, that can help you with creating a tree. There's also a lot of documents uh, online on various sites that you can print and actually hand fill out all the information that's needed. But if you go for the online program, most of these will require that you sign up. Probably the most well-known program is Ancestry.com. I think we've all heard of it. Maybe we've uh, gone in and uh, did our DNA. They offer fee-based services and a database that you can access among other things that they offer. So that's probably the most well-known. The other you may or may not be familiar with, and quite honestly, I didn't learn about this until I'd already <clears throat> been doing genealogy for a little bit, is FamilySearch.org. 
Now, this is a free online database that originates from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They believe that families can be together after this life. So for them, discovering and preserving information about family members helps in strengthening their relationship for those who are alive and those who have passed on. So from these beliefs, they have amassed a tremendous database that you can access online just signing up. So that um, may be the way to go is FamilySearch.org if you're not able to pay for a service. <clears throat> so have you found your family in a census? Obviously, we're here today with the Census Bureau, and so these are uh, questions that you might want to ask yourself if you've not ever looked at a census record. Actually, that was probably one of the first things I found out about and realized had tremendous amount of information that I could use. So the censuses are taken uh, or have been taken since 1790 and then every 10 years after that. And so you may want to look at some of these censuses to find past uh, family. Digital images of these census schedules are available online from 1790 to 1950. And so we release these records um, every 10 years, every year that ends with the number two. And so in 22, we last released the 1950 census. So then in 32, we'll release the 1960 census and so on. And this is because we decided at one point that these records would be kept confidential for 72 years or the average lifespan of an individual. So we'll have more of these schedules coming out in the future. Now, these schedules or records are initially kept at the National Archives, and then eventually they're partner sites, as uh, I mentioned, Ancestry, Family Search, and various other online programs uh, have copies of these records. So a census record provides a lot, as I mentioned, a lot of useful information for family history research. This image that you see on the screen is just a partial image that I zoomed in on. So you get names of individuals, ages, places of birth, uh, marital status, uh, the names, uh, I'm sorry, the birthplace of parents, so grandparents' birthplaces. Um, and then street addresses and more are available on these records. Now, do keep in mind that the number of questions asked on a census varied over the decades. So depending on which census you're looking at, uh, some may have more information that was asked of the participants or fewer questions. So that's why you'll see a difference. But you can use the name of a relative and the state they were living in to get started on your research. So there's a process for a census. And this is me just compacting the process uh, into a small explanation, but Censuses are taken of every household, whether it's a house, an apartment, or some other type of dwelling. It could be a, a houseboat or something, uh, some other dwelling that you can think of. Census takers used to go to each dwelling, collecting the information for that particular census. And these census takers were given an area in a size that could be covered within a census period, within the time 
that we allotted to do the census. Then in 1880, these areas were called enumeration districts and have been called that since. And census takers were called enumerators. So you'll see those terms depending on what you're looking at uh, they're sort of interchangeable, so they're actually talking about the same thing. Now, I want to give you a tip at this point, because this is something that you probably won't realize or think of, but in my research, uh, I came across this, is to actually check out the instructions the enumerators were given to do the census. So for each year that we did the census, we have instructions that were given to the census takers or enumerators in order to do their job. Now, these instructions covered the duties, uh, filling out the census schedule, um, how to answer questions, and basically how to handle situations that may arise from visiting these different dwellings. But these instructions also cover codes and notations that you may come across when you're looking at census records. These enumerators would write in these codes or notes, and you'll see that on, on different um, images. And they may make other notes to themselves or something that they were uh, finding out. And that's all very interesting. And, you, and it could explain more about your family at the time of the census if those notations refer to your family. But if you see why they used the codes they used or made the notes from the instructions, I think that will give you a better understanding of, of the information that they were taking um, from the household. Now, in order, to find these instructions, you can actually find them on other sites, but you can go to census.gov, our website, slash history, and that will take you to our history page. And really, for genealogists, this is a page that's sort of hidden away and that you're not normally familiar that we have this information. and you can go to this page and you'll see that they have tabs across the top. And if you'll click on the Through the Decades tab first, and then you'll see another page and it'll give you um, a tab, Census Instructions, and click on that. I've showed a, an image here on the screen to kind of show you what that would look like. And you can see that I've clicked on the 1940 and the 1950 instructions to try to educate myself on what they were told to do. So you'll click on whichever of the censuses you're interested in, and the instructions will, uh, which have been scanned, will come on the screen and you can look at those. But while you're on the history page, check out some of the other tabs we have an index of questions that were asked on each of the censuses. We have famous and infamous people from past records that you might be interested in, celebrities, uh, presidents, um, sports figures. We have all types of people uh, that are on census records that maybe you're related to or maybe you're just interested in reading about. And there's other facts that might be helpful in your research on the, our history page. So please don't um, hesitate to, to take a look at that. I've, I've really enjoyed looking at that page. So now let's talk about what are enumeration maps. Now the images that you see on the screen are examples of maps. Uh, one is a zoomed in uh, screenshot. So an enumeration district is used by the Census Bureau was an area that could be covered by a single enumerator during a census period. I mentioned that before. But these districts varied in size from 
several city blocks and a densely populated urban area to an entire county in a sparsely populated rural area. And that may be the case. I know for myself and doing my family history, they lived on farms and ranches. And so I'm looking a lot at rural areas. Enumeration district maps are not available for all years and all locations. This could be for many reasons. Uh, the first reason would be that the map, uh, the enumerator lost the map or somehow it was destroyed before they decided to scan the map. Um, then uh, maybe uh, a map was left off of the scanning. So there's several reasons why you may not find um, a map for the year that you're looking for or for the location that you're looking for. Now, these maps are scanned images, as I mentioned earlier, that are available at the National Archives website, and that's archives.gov slash census, and that will take you directly to the pages. Um, You'll see that the enumeration district numbers and the street numbers on these maps, they're marked uh, on the maps, but not individual homes. So some of the maps, I do have to tell you, um, actually had markings that the enumerators marked on the map. Some of them, I believe, marked that they'd been to a certain dwelling and wanted to make sure that they didn't forget that they'd already visited. So you will come across some that have dots or markings that were made by the enumerators. Now, these maps show boundaries and the numbers of the census enumeration districts, which were established to help administer and control the collection of the data. And I have highlighted in red one of the uh, district numbers on a map. So you could see it might have been printed, it might have been written in with a pencil. Um, so you'll see that in, in different forms. Now, there were wards, precincts, uh, unincorporated places, urban unincorporated areas, townships, supervisor districts, uh, congressional districts, all of those could appear on some of these maps. So the content of these maps varies greatly. And the reason for that is that originally we didn't have a geography department that could draw maps and produce maps for us. So in the beginning, they were taking maps that had been obtained locally. So it could be a postal route map, a general land office map, um, a soil survey map, or a map that was produced by a city, a county, a government agency, or even a commercial map. Maybe uh, gas stations gave away you know, a local map to an area with a fill-up of gas. So they were using maps that had already been produced for these areas. So you're going to see, uh, as, as you go back, all types of maps. So they took these maps and then they drew the district boundaries and the numbers on these maps. But for any censuses before for 1900, they used voting districts as the enumeration district boundaries. Now, you can see more about that in the National Archives. There is a publication uh, titled Cardiographic Records of the Census Bureau. And so you can access that on the archives uh, site and that is for censuses before 1900. Now, to find voting district maps, you can go to the Library of Congress, and they have a book 
called Ward Maps of the United States, a selective checklist of pre-1900 maps. So these are long titles, but if you'll search for that, if you're going further than 1900, um, then that would be uh, a big help to you to see exactly what they were using. So let me give you another tip. Um, you may or may not have heard of Stephen Morris. Um, this is a resource that I find uh, and I recommend to fellow genealogy researchers all the time. This gentleman uh, created a site, stevemorris.org, um, and he has a wealth of information. Um, he's got links to finding immigration records, vital records, maps, calendars, I mean, all types of documents related to genealogy. The work that he did, because this, um, I've had, uh, I've recommended this site to some people and they say, oh, I don't, I don't know, I'm, you know, I don't know that I'll ever use that. But, I swear you will find something that you can use on Mr. Morris's site. So I definitely recommend that you go to his site. But one of the main reasons that I'm mentioning uh, Mr. Morris's site is that he's created a tool. If maybe you already know where your family was living during a, a certain census, maybe your family was able to tell you they always lived at this address. You can go to this tool on Mr. Morris's site, stevemorris.org slash census slash unified, and it'll take you to his tool. You select 1940, 1950, the year that you're looking for. You select the state, the county, the city. You type in the house number, the street name, and it will give you the enumeration district for that address. I mean, I just think that's wonderful that people are out there that can do something like this. Um, I think it's helped a lot of people and it may help you as well. Um, so I recommend that you uh, keep Mr. Morris in mind when you're looking for something. He may be able to, to help you. So now I've been talking about the National Archives. Um, so to get to the archives, it's archives.gov slash research slash census. And that will take you to the page uh, for census records. So uh, as I mentioned before, the archives, they're the keepers of government documents. Census records are considered historical government documents. So we do, after every census, we do send copies of these documents to the National Archives. Um, and I know for the 1950 census, for those of us that were looking to find family on the 1950 census, we were all excited. Uh, to be able to look at that and see where our family was living during that time, who was living with our family. Um, and so you went to the National Archives and then eventually uh, the archives shared those records with Ancestry, Family Search, and other online programs so that you could go and do research. But if you go to this main page, you'll be able to select uh, on that page, for example, uh, the 1940 census. Uh, you can select that from the left side of the page. I don't believe you can see that in the image, but I'm going to show you a zoomed in image. Once you click on the 1940 census, you'll see what you're seeing on the screen now, part one, part two, and part three. 
And if you go under section three, you'll see that it says enumeration district maps. And so you'll click on that because these are all hyperlinks. And this collection covers the 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940 uh, censuses. So you'll be uh, clicking on that. And then you'll come to uh, another page, the image on the top of the screen. It'll say enumeration district and related maps. So once you're on that page, you'll see that there's a link for the National Archives catalog. And so an example of that is what you see in the lower image on the screen. And there's filters, so you'll be able to filter down because these maps are listed by state and then by county. So that will help you to filter down to the area that you're looking for. And so uh, I'll provide that uh, in the, on a resource page that you'll go to catalogs.archives.gov slash search to get to this place on the screen. So another way to find enumerator maps, and personally this is my preferred way, but either going to the National Archives or to FamilySearch.org um, will work for you to get. It's whatever you, uh, you're comfortable using. And I'm going to show you the example of, of how I go about finding these maps on Family Search. So you see there's an image, and that's the main page of FamilySearch.org. And there's a search, the word search at the top. And so you would click on that, and then that will take you to the search page. And once you get on the search page, you'll Scroll down a little bit and you'll see find a collection. And it'll look like this image here on the right. And uh, then there's a little box that you can type in for the collection title. Now, the first time I did this, I thought they were kidding because I eventually, after many tries, because I didn't know the name of the collection at the time, found out that the name of the collection is United States Enumeration District Map for the 12th through the 16th U.S. Censuses, 1900 through 1940. Now, I know that sounds like a joke, but quite honestly, that is the title of this collection. I couldn't remember that title many times trying to pull up this collection, but I found that if I started typing the word enumeration or something close to it, I would get a pop-up list and I would finally see United States Enumeration District and so on, and then I could click on that to get to the collection. So if you do that, you'll see a box, like the box you see now on the screen, uh, with the title, some information, but then you'll see a button on how to use the collection, which you can read, or browse all of these images. And so I click on browse all the images, and this is what you would see on your screen. Um, it's not easy to read because you can't see all of this. I just wanted to give you an idea of what you're going to be seeing on this screenshot here that I took. Uh, but this is a list of all the National Archive uh, microfish rolls that have all of these images on them. And they're in alphabetical order by state and then by county. So you'll need to uh, 
know where your family was living, the state, and then a name of one of your family members. Now, let me show you a little bit of a zoomed in image, and you might be able to see this a little better on your screen. So it'll say roll, uh, for example, roll 59 South Dakota, and then it's counties Edmonds through Zeebock, Zeebock, 1900 through 1940. So if that's what you're looking for, then you would click on that link to take you to the images. So now let me back up just a little bit and let me show you using my family as an example so that you can kind of see the process. Of course, you know, where did my family live during the 1940 uh, census? So I had to go with what I knew, and that's how we all have to start. Um, I knew some of the stories my father had told me. Um, he was born in Coriel County in 1909, and um, I knew some things that he had told me about his life. And so his father was Patricio Guerra, born in 1852. His mother, Margarita Estrada, born in 1875. And he was the youngest of nine. Um, his mother died when he was 10 months old. So he was raised by his brothers and sisters. And then his father died when he was 24 years old. And then when he was 26, his oldest brother, who here is Natividad, passed away. However, on his deathbed, he asked my father to please take care of his children. And he had six, ranging from five to 16. And so my father said, yes, he would definitely take care of his children. So my father was probably in his maybe mid-20s, I believe, when this happened. But he took on this responsibility of uh, raising his nieces and nephews. And so I thought, knowing all of that, well, he's going to be pretty easy to find. It's a single guy with a lot of kids. Um, and so, yes, I actually was able to find him on the 1940 census, and this is a close-up image of that census record. And so it shows my father with his nieces and nephews and a brother who had been widowed with his son. So it was my father, his brother, and all of those children. Another thing that uh, I learned from the stories that my father had told us about his life. They had always worked for the Townsend family in Lampasas County, and his family had worked with these people for decades. And I happened to see in this census record at the bottom here of this image, there's Milton and Victoria who are living in a dwelling next to nearby where my father and his family were living. So all of this all fit into the, to the story and what I knew about my family. Now, let's take a look uh, at a couple of areas on the census record. So uh, the top left corner of any census record will look similar to this. Uh, it'll, uh, the enumerator has to write in the state, the county. If it was an urban area, they would fill in incorporated place. If it was an area just out in the county, and that's this case, um, then this is Justice of the Peace Precinct 4 that this, these people were located. And this enumerator also made a note that you may or may not be able to read. It says family continued from sheet three. So this is an example of what I'm saying when you're looking at census records, look at 
what they write in the margins or notations that they make, because that could be more clues uh, for you um, on your family. So now let's look at the right side of that. Um, so again, you still see the titles of the columns uh, on this side of the schedule, but up at the top right corner, you'll see SD number, and that's supervisor district number. Each supervisor had a number of enumeration districts under their supervision. Then next to that, you see ED number, and they've written in 141-8. Uh, and then uh, Mr. William Ernest Cox enumerated these folks on April the 12th of 1940, and it's sheet number 4B. So the, um, the really important thing for me is the enumeration district number, which is 141-8. But this also brings to mind something else I should uh, let you know is that we had what we call Census Day, and now Census Day moving forward is April the 1st of every census year. So in the past, some of those dates varied for different reasons. I think one time it was because of weather, they changed the Census Day. Uh, so they've been in, Census Day has been in May and June, I think once it was in August. Um, so depending on what census you're looking at, uh, census day will vary. And the reason it's important to know this is because if you're looking for someone who you know was born in the year you're looking at, if they were not born before census day or before the day that that uh, family was enumerated, in this case, April the 12th, if they were born in June or September of that year, you're not going to find them on the 1940 census. So you may be looking and wonder, well, I know they were born during this time, why do, not, do I not find them? But it's because of the date. So you need to take a look at that. Um, and there is a list on our history page of when each census, uh, what, Census Day was for each year, and so you can you can find that uh, on our history page. So uh, this is an overall image of that census record where I found my family, and uh, because I was doing this on Family Search, uh, looking at this image, it automatically highlights who you're searching for. And so uh, that's why you see the highlights. But um, when you're trying to find out what the address or the location is for a family, that is actually the first column on the sheet on the left side. And they write it vertically. In this case, the enumerator, Mr. Cox, wrote County Road. And it looks like the number two, but I'm not sure. I kind of zoomed in, it's a little faded. So that would be the road that all of these people on this census record were living off of that road or street. Um, and in some cases, if it's an urban area, they may even put a block number, although they'll write a block number up at the top left portion of this record. Uh, you may see some of them write it on the side, or they'll write in the margin something about uh, the area, um, you know, the it was on the downhill side, or all the houses were blue, or whatever notations they made. Um, so always look at that first column on the left to find the location, and then they'll put the dwelling number, they put the number of order that they enumerated, and then another column will give you the, the dwelling number. 
or address. So now back to the roles of images. Um, so I went to the role that would have Lampasas County, and that was role number 63. And I just want to show you kind of what will come up based on what you select. It'll be a, a number of images. In this case, there's a little over 900 images in this role. The images should be in alphabetical order, and I say should be because in my research, I have found that sometimes they're not in alphabetical order. You'll have to keep searching forward. Uh, they may be out of order, uh, or you may find um, images for 1910 next to 1940, and then further on you'll find 1920 or 1930 images. So for the most part, they they are in order, but I just want to tell you that sometimes that's not the case. Um, so then I decided that Lampasas was in the middle of the alphabet, and I kind of started looking at the images starting from the middle of all of those images and just kind of started going through them. And I came on this image that you see on the left, image 878. And I recognized the counties that were on the border of this image as counties that were surrounding Lampasas County. And then up at the top of the image, I zoomed in. And on the right, you'll see the image. It says election precinct. And someone has kindly numbered all of those precincts and the, the towns associated in those areas. Um, and for me, that was a great help. I thought, wow, this is good. I, I recognize these areas. And then at the very bottom, it says 1929, which I didn't pay attention to that at first. I was just excited that I found an image with what I was, I thought I was looking for. So then I uh, went on to image uh, 879. And so the image on the left is showing you kind of the overall image. And the one on the right is a zoomed in area. And when I zoomed in, I could see the number 141-8. So I got extremely excited because this was the enumeration district that I was looking for. Now, this uh, scan was not very good because uh, the lettering is very faint. I zoomed in. I tried figuring out if I could read uh, the landowner's name, and it was difficult. There weren't any roads uh, on this map, and I thought, I'm going to have to go to a plat map and look at all of this. So I was kind of exasperated. But then I realized on the image on the left, up at the very top, it says 1930. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm not even at a 1940 image yet. So I thought, I've got to move on. So I did. And I came across image 884. And this image is much clearer. I recognize the shape of the county, the surrounding counties. And then I see a number four in dark print, and I zoom in on that. And in my notes, I had Justice of the Peace Precinct 4. So I got excited again. And this map actually had uh, rivers and roads listed on it. So I decided to keep looking, and the next image, I sort of hit pay dirt because this image, um, again, was clear. It was somebody stamped with a stamp, 1940 office map. There was a legend. Um, someone wrote uh, in pencil EDs 141-1 to 141-10. I could clearly see the Lampasas River name, so this was so much better, and this was a map from the Texas Highway Department, where the other map was like a county uh, plot map. 
So this was a much better map uh, for me to, to look at. But I continued uh, zooming in and uh, saw that there were dots on this map. My father had told us stories of a swimming hole that they used to go to after long work days uh, on the farm. And um, he actually took us when we were young to this. And this swimming hole was at the intersection of Lampasas River and Spool Creek, which I could see on this map. And I circled in red the area where almost right in the middle is this swimming hole. And I even saw these cemetery symbols, these little crosses in, an, uh, in a square, which stands for a cemetery. And I realized, oh my gosh, this is where my father lived. And at this point, that was 83 years ago that my father lived there in 1940. Now, I've researched this area physically. These homes are no longer there. There's other uh, structures and uh, other things going on. But I know that my father was in one of these dots. And as silly as that sounds, that was very comforting to me to find that part of uh, family history, that when I tell stories about my family, I can sort of share the area, what it looked like. And so I'm hoping that this example that I'm showing you will not discourage you to use enumeration maps, but in fact, encourage you to see if you can find your family. Yeah, I will admit it's easier if your family lived in urban areas because there's blocks and street names and so forth. But these maps really add another layer to your history. So I, I want to encourage you to look at these maps. Um, these are pictures of my family, my great grandfather, Patricio, uh, my father on the right corner. That's actually a picture I cut myself out of my graduation day, and he and I. Uh, took a picture, then my brother and his family, and then my parents in the bottom corner. And like all of us that are looking for our family, uh, I believe we do it to honor our family and the ones that we never knew and wished we had. And so this takes a lot of research. And I want you to know that I'm not a professional, but I am willing to help you in any way I can, especially with census records, enumeration maps, or enumeration instructions, um, anything that I can help you with, I am here to do that because I, I know what it takes to, to do research. Now, I have included my steps for using familysearch.org to help you find the, the maps. Um, and I've helped many people go through these steps and find uh, where their family was living. So again, I certainly don't mind helping you. And then I also um, have uh, all the links that I spoke about during the presentation. So I hope that this uh, will help you in finding your family. Here's my contact information. Again, again, please don't hesitate. It would be my pleasure to assist you, not just with genealogy, but any data research that you're doing. Um, and I would love to help you in any way that I can. And I thank you so, so much for attending and for your attention. And if there's any questions that I can answer, I'll be happy to do that for you. Thank you. A question in the chat. Um, how can I find out if the enumerator's map for Trumansburg, town of Ulysses, Tompkins County, New York, still exists and was just skipped in the scanning if it doesn't appear in the scan set on archives.gov or if it is lost? 
I can tell you that, and I have called um, the National Archives myself several times and talked to them, and the answer has pretty much been the same, that uh, either there was not a map to begin with for whatever reason, something happened to the map, or uh, it was missed, or it could have been scanned and put on a different roll. So really, that is a lot of research to kind of figure that out, but I usually go with the first two, that it was either the map didn't exist for some reason, lost or whatever the case may be, and it wasn't scanned. Um, so I move forward from that, but you can continue looking at some of the role, either a role before or after. Um, I wish, um, I asked the archives why these are not indexed. And of course they said they just take the documents as they receive them, and there was never an index. So that's why there is no index. Um, I personally, when I retire, if I'm bored, I think I'm going to index Texas myself <laughs> and put it out there for people because I think that would help uh, answer a lot of questions. Um, I hope that helped. Hey, Susie, uh, did you share in the message uh, when the census documents become public? Uh, yes, uh, it's um, after they are released, uh, and that's every year that ends with the two. So we've released up to the 1950. Now, the uh, I believe the enumeration maps are available uh, on archives.gov from 1950. Uh, I don't believe they may, I haven't looked on Family Search whether they have copies of those or not, but the archives do have the latest, which is the 1950. The 1960 will be out in 2032, and they're always out first on the National Archives website. And then eventually they trickle down to the partners like Ancestry or FamilySearch.org. So they're released every 72 years after the census happened. Any other questions? Okay, I think that concludes the questions. Okay, great. I, yes, I was looking to make sure <laughs> that I wasn't <laughs> missing anything. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Susie, for this excellent webinar. And before we conclude, I'd like to thank everyone who played a role in today's webinar. And also, of course, thank you to you, our audience, for spending your time with us this afternoon. Please take a moment to fill out the evaluation by following the link provided in the chat. Look out for the recording and the PowerPoint from this workshop on the Census Academy by visiting census.gov forward slash academy. That brings us to a close, so we thank you again and hope you have a great afternoon. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation and you may disconnect at this time.